Well, praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to The Christian and the Culture, a program yes. designed to help you to observe what's going on in the world, but from a biblical perspective. We want to maintain loyalty and uh, a, a sense of scriptural reality with all of the things that are happening in the world. I'm your host, Bishop Eric Lambert of Bethel Deliverance International Church, and joining me as always are my two outstanding co-hosts, Pastor Brian Weatherspoon of Tabernacle Harvest Church of Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Pastor, greet our audience today. Thank you, Bishop. God bless you, Christian and Culture family. Uh, once again, stay tuned. Great conversation on your way. Take some notes, and uh, let's get ready to fellowship. Praise the Lord. And our dear friend and brother, uh, Pastor Timothy Baldwin of Bethel Deliverance in Northeast Philadelphia. Pastor Baldwin, will you greet our audience? Good day, uh, Christian and the Culture family. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, as we always say, we, we're looking forward to an exciting and interesting conversation today. Stay tuned. That's great. Well, gentlemen, uh, today we want to observe a few passages of Scripture that I think will help us to regain focus. Over the past few months, I would really say over the past maybe three years, the body of Christ has been struggling with identity, being consumed in the cultural exchange of ideas and political views that has caused many in the body of Christ to take a stance that really brought about division and confrontation. Yeah. Jesus praised something in John's gospel. He said, the world will know that we are his disciples because we have love one for another. And in that context, he prays that God would make us one to unify us. I'm going to ask the two of you to take a moment to address this unity prayer of Jesus. I want to do two things. First, I want you to evaluate the unity of the church in the world today. Secondly, what did Jesus mean when he talks about unity? Uh, Pastor Brian, you take the first one. Pastor Tim, you take the unity question, because this will serve as the segue for us to go to the other couple passages we hope to bring to the people today. Pastor Brian? Absolutely. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, yeah, one, you know, the, the model prayer, Jesus prays that, you know, one at the Father, that we would be one with him as he's one with the Father. And um, we know the climate of the church now I think we're, we're talking about unity. I think there's a small desire for unity. But if you ask me, were we really unified? The answer is no. Uh, you know, I think once again, we have a lot of ambition. We have a lot of, a uh, lot too many egos in the way. Uh, it's a lack, lack of maturity all over the place. Some, some is a lack of just, you know, uh, uh, an inability to connect. Um, and once again, um, you know, the enemy has been clever. Satan's been clever at trying to get us to make each other our enemy or make each other the one I need to hide from uh, or, or not share with when technically it's supposed to be the opposite. So Jesus' prayer was right on point. He knew this day would come when the church probably would be a fragmented organism. And uh, but we know this, that by also by his prayer. The church will ultimately be united by the time he comes back to get us. Well, okay. That's an, <laughs> <laughs> that's an opinion. All right, we'll hold off on that for a moment. Pastor Tim? Uh, we are in terrible position as it relates to being unified. I just will come out and say it. Uh, we, we, it we're terrible. The church is terrible. And all, the, the, uh, all of the things that are going on right now, have has really pulled the cover off of the the um, disunity, the disconnect in the body. When you look at when you look at God, when you look at the Trinity, the Trinity is really the model for like relationality for the church, right? God in relationship, like in relationship, really with Himself through the Spirit and the Son. That's the model for us. And so, so, so in that text where He talks about make them one. You know, he goes on to talk about make them one like you and I are one. And in the, 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 the model is the Trinity. We look at the Trinity and we see that that in a relationship, 
And the church does not resemble that today. The church is far from that relationality that, that God has, uh, again, like I said, with himself, really, but in the person of the, the spirit and, and the son of God. And so when we, when we look at unity, I, we are doing a terrible job uh, at being unified in this time and in this season. And I don't think that it's any different than it was five or 10 years ago. I just think some of the, some of the, the occurrences uh, and uh, current events have really pulled back the cover and exposed how disunified we are. Yeah, I, I think that there are a number of issues. I cannot just identify one thing. Um, it is obvious that the unity in the body of Christ just is not there. And I'm kind of a, you know, a practical person as I begin to look for reasons. And I really don't want to do that on our broadcast because, we, number one, we don't have enough time. And number two, uh, it's really irrelevant. Right now, we need to move forward. Yes. We need to try to establish the kingdom principle. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, Jesus makes a statement. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace give I unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Yeah. This absence of peace, gentlemen, uh, one of the things that really bothered me over the past six, eight months was the church's focus on a person rather than the Lord. Yes. And what's causing us to do this? What made us shift our dependency from Christ onto a political party or a person and then set ourselves up for frustration and despair. Pastor Tim? Um, we have become idolatrous. We have become idolatrous. We you have, said that, not me. I, I said it. I, I stand by that. <laughs> Pastor Tim is hitting them on the head. That's yeah, I mean, we've become idolatrous. Even when you look in the Gospels, when Jesus comes, and uh, Jesus would do certain miracles. He would say, don't tell anybody about it. And we get the whole messianic secret thing, right? He doesn't want anybody to know who he is. And it's not because he doesn't want people to know he's, he, he's who he is as, as, as it relates to Christ. But he, he, he says, my time is not here yet. And he recognizes that, that they are looking for a political leader. They're looking for someone to come exonerate them from the hard uh, fist and the hard hand of the Roman government who, who are taxing them to death into poverty, right? And so he comes on the scene and they're looking for this political leader. And, and Jesus says, I, I'm not here to be a political leader. I'm here to establish a heavenly kingdom. And that's why I'm here. And, and so again, that, that when you look at it from that perspective, we become idolaters. We put people, parties, and political figures in the place of Christ in the kingdom. Pastor Brian, what are we supposed to be? And if you could identify at least just a smattering of that reflection, what are we supposed to be as members of the body of Christ? I'm not interested in the doing because over the past three months, we've seen a lot of doing, but yes. we didn't see much being. Mm. What are we supposed to be? Very good question, uh, Bishop. And uh, I, I love the term ecclesia. And, and, you know, a lot of times we throw it around loosely and just say that's the, you know, the Greek name for church. But it's more than that. It's, it's the, the origin of that word means this was the military power, very elite individuals chosen, handpicked because they were skilled, they were wise, they were, they were filled with governmental ability. And they called the shots throughout all of the Athens world, the, Gre the Greco-Roman world. And it's amazing how when Paul talks about the church, he uses a very militaristic term. So when you say how we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be very vehement, very fervent in our faith. And all we've done, and the reason why it's so watered down, and that shift didn't happen with this election, it was happening for a long time. Yes. We've become the Laodicean exchange. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last week. Whenever you stop going hard for the kingdom of light, there's only another kingdom you can serve. There's not five others. There's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. The scripture identifies them both. So here's what I've seen, Bishop. Instead of us being the militaristic might, calling the shots in this realm, binding and loosing, stopping and ceasing, instead of being that church, those people, 
we have exchanged our devotion to a worldly concept. And this is why we're so caught up. If we get back to Ecclesia, true definition, we're going to be a powerful entity in the earth. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, we're missing the opportunity to impact. Absolutely. What we are looking for, based on many of the things that have been said and many of the speeches and messages that we've heard, especially over the last three months, what it appears is that they're looking for the things that the Antichrist will bring. Uh oh. The things that are contrary <laughs> to God under a guise of Christianity. Yes. You no, know, abortion has become a big issue and justifiably so. You know, mm -hmm. I hate it. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. Sure. But I mean, the Bible talks about people going into the lake of fire who love and make lies. Yeah. So apparently right. to God, he doesn't differentiate. Sure. Apparently to God, sin is sin. sin and, is sin. you know, I see the body of Christ looking for what Daniel says the Antichrist will do. And I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. Pastor Tim, uh, Paul writes something to the church at Philippi. He says in chapter 3, verse 20, he said, our citizenship is in heaven. The King James says our, our politics you know, uh, our, you know, it's, it's, it's not the best word, but the word is better translated uh, citizenships. Uh, he, he, he uses the word conversation and it's translated citizenship, politics. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, we eagerly await a savior from heaven. Now, are we really mindful of the fact that we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven? And how does that relate to us being physical citizens of the United States in general and the world at large. Yeah, you know, Bishop, I, I don't think the church at large is really aware of that. I, I don't know if we do enough teaching on kingdom citizenship, because when you look at our climate now, it seems like the church and, and, and the world is just living for the, the now, today, and where, you know, uh, the scripture tells us that that that, that we, you know, our, 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 um, uh, again, citizenship is in heaven. You know, our 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 um, reward is in heaven. You know, and it's. I don't think there's anything wrong with us being blessed while we're here. But Paul writes something in Romans 12. You know, one and two. Don't be conformed to this world. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, uh, that word to be transformed is is to to not be uh, or conformed is to not be poured into a mold. And so I don't think that the church is as cognizant as it should be. Um, as it relates to our citizenship not being here, we are sojourning here. We know that we are we are just uh, aliens here, as the scripture said. And our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in Christ, and and not again, not in this system. And we have to do a better job with teaching that and living that, and being able to model that as well. Gentlemen, here's my dilemma, and I, I'm 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 not moving off of the question because I've been asking it for over a decade, over 10 years, uh, is the Bible really the word of God? And should we live by those principles? Absolutely. Absolutely. The Bible is the word of God. We should be living by those principles. And the problem is we should have never deterred from them. We, we, we walked away, we stepped away. And even in, in levels of Christendom, uh, those, the, the, the Bible is kind of an addendum to man's dogma as opposed to being the actual doctrine we live by. I mean, even in most of our churches, we don't even talk about the doctrines of, of Christianity, the doctrines of our faith, so that people's foundations are more secure, so that when times like these come, and, they, and the Bible says they will come, people won't shift as much. They won't be tossed to and fro as much. So I think the church, we as pastors, have to get back to teaching that, reminding them the world we live in. You know, that Jesus left us in the world and said it was going to be ugly. And in fact, he said it was going to be a world that you would even be hated. And it's going to be the prerequisite to know that you're even of me. And if they hated me, they're going to hate you too. Yes. So stop looking for their acceptance and be who I've called you to be. And it may cost you a lot. And this is what we don't, we're not talking about cost anymore. We're talking about get along. 
the love gospel, love everything, love everybody, love every instance. When you can't love everything and you can't love every issue and say, I love God. You know, I can go on and on with this whole premise, but the truth is we've got to get back to a place where we are teaching the foundation, the kingdom, the scripture says, if the foundations be destroyed, where can the righteous go? Our foundations have been destroyed. we got to build them back. Pastor Tim, uh, uh, Pastor Brian talks about uh, taking a stand, really, yeah. taking a stand for the things of God. Amen. How radical should we be as Christians in taking that stand if we really believe in the sovereignty of God and acceptance of his choices? How radical should we be? Uh, I, you know, as radical as we need to be, Bishop, to make changes. You That's know? too simple. I, was about, I knew he was going to say that. I know. Uh, you know, Bishop, uh, so, I, you know, as it relates to rad being radical, you know, how we live, how we preach, how we teach, you know, really denying ourselves. And, you know, I think that there is this... Uh, Pastor Brian said it, this love gospel, but but I like to call it the, the comfort gospel where, you know, where we preach a gospel that's comfortable to people. And it's, it's not a comfortable thing to take up your cross. It's not a comfortable thing to, uh, as Paul writes throughout all of his epistles, that we are going to have tribulation, that there is going to be times where the church is going to be persecuted. And I think I think more than anything, the church is trying to avoid persecution. Yes. The church says that it's inevitable. It's going to happen. You know, there are times where, you know, we have had inconveniences. We, we've not, not in the, not in the Western church. We've not seen persecution. We've not seen uh, a tribulation as uh, in times of past or in third world countries in the smaller countries. And we can't get away from being so radical that says, you know what, if this means that I lose my platform, I'm, I'm going to live for God. If this means that I'm going to lose finances, if, if the biggest tithers and givers are going to walk away from my church because I'm teaching the truth of the word of God, then I have to be okay with that. And that's being radical. See, that's the thing that really bothered me over the past three or four months was there was this, this, this fear uh, teaching that said, oh, if a certain candidate wins, he's going, they're going to come after the churches. And uh, many of the Christians were, you know, scared. But you know what? You never know. And I'm quoting Corey Ten Boom here. You never know how big Jesus is until you really need him. Yeah. That's right. And so for years, we've gone around on this pleasure cruise with the world. And Jesus said, they're supposed to hate us. If you go back to the first century, right. Christians weren't put up as heroes. They were hunted Those down. Guys. They were talked about, you know, and they did not uh, put themselves in a position to be tied up to the world. But gentlemen, Daniel says something in chapter two of his uh, prophecy. In chapter two, uh, verse 21, Daniel talks about God and he says, he changes the times and the seasons. Yes. He removes kings and raises up kings. Absolutely. If we really believe in the sovereignty of God, wouldn't it be wise for us to accept what he allows and then just do what Paul says, pray for those that are in authority and Absolutely. believe that God will make up the difference instead of slander, uh, fault finding, criticizing. And we're supposed to be the light of the world and the salt Absolutely. of the earth. And yet the thing that really amazes me is during this whole process, you don't hear much from other faiths that people put down. You know what I'm saying? It's like the yep. people who say we believe in the sovereignty of God are fighting that sovereignty. And if God allowed it, then apparently he knows what he's doing. Absolutely. What do you have to say about that? Each of you take a minute and just comment on that view. It goes back to what I said in the beginning. That's the telltale sign that we become idolaters, that we, we put people in place uh, of the Lord and we do not. The sovereignty of God only works when it benefits us. That, that's the bottom line. And because, again, the last uh, uh, candidate, it was the sovereignty of God. God yeah, allowed whoever him. wins. Right. Whoever lives it. And, and here's the other thing, too, Bishop. You cannot legislate the heart of men. You just can't. 
That's what the gospel is for. The gospel is the tool that will legislate the heart of men. That's when a, a abortion will be abolished in the hearts of people and not on a paper or a, a legislation. And so, so again, it, we, we become idolaters. We put our political figures and, and our stars and celebrities uh, in places to take care of us, wherein we should have allowed God and should be allowing God to take that place. And take That's the a good point. In front of our lives. Pastor man. Brian, one minute. Is God in control or not? God is in control and we don't really like it. And, and, and that's just the bottom line truth. We have, uh, especially the Western church, we've convinced ourselves that we're in control. Uh, we kind of preach like it. We act like it. And uh, even though we say things of sovereignty as it relates to God, the truth is we believe we control it. We believe we control this political process. We believe because of our state of democracy that you know, I know everybody says our vote counts, but, you know, you know, praise God. Yeah, it, we it, it vote. Does. We should vote. We should, we should do. vote. Yes, we go to vote. Yes. And it's uh, a voice. I, just in case anybody needs to know, I did vote. However, we understand that God chooses whom he wants for his and reasons. The biblical response. Amen. The biblical response is whoever's in the seat, we still are obligated as believers Amen. biblically to pray for them and to wish God's best upon them. Not yes. talk them down, not right. wish something bad, right. but pray the blessing of the Lord so that they lead us. One of my favorite movies is Gods and Generals. And there's the yeah. battle at Fredericksburg and each of the generals come up to report to Robert E. Lee what they've done to prepare for the battle. And the actor makes this statement. He said, these are all good plans. He said, but now the results are in the hand of God. Amen. So we do everything we can do, but then we leave the results with God, and then we don't talk negatively as Christians. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 says, there are six things that the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination, oh, a proud look, haughtiness, arrogance, a lying tongue, people who shed uh, innocent blood, those who like to plot evil, eagerness to do wrong, a false witness speaking lies. Right. And those that sow discord among the brethren. Yes. That's what the Bible says. So if you are speaking uh, negatively about people and you're sowing seeds of discord, you're just as much in violation as any other sinner. That's right. As a Christian, we, we, we exercise our rights. We give our view. But then whatever God allows, we go to God and we trust him to do what is right. Maybe your candidate won. Maybe he did not win. Uh, I will tell you that now it's over. Go to God and ask God to touch whoever's there so that his right. will will be done. And write a letter presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. I write letters to my congressmen and senators, and I share the gospel. Mm -hmm. And they can't say they didn't hear it from me. So rather Amen. than curse the darkness, light a candle. You see, Amen. it is important <laughs> that we understand the Bible is the word of God yes. and the things yep. that God says will come to pass. Now, we've had a lot of people saying God said such and such and such oh, and such. And yeah. the Lord said, I did not tell them to make those statements. And, and in Deuteronomy 18, he said, if somebody comes to you and says, the Lord said so and so, and it doesn't come to pass, he said, they're false prophets. Yes. And I'm not trying to demonize anybody, people of God. I'm simply saying that we need to understand that most times prophecy comes from our own personal desires and our own personal wants. And we think God is telling us what the Lord is not saying. So let's stop the arguing. Let's stop the fighting. Let's right. love one another. That's right. We thank you for joining us today. Your presence, your comments are always welcome. So take the time to write to us and to encourage us, even if you don't agree, it's an encouragement because we love you. And if we're wrong, we'll come back and correct that statement because we know we're not always 100% right. Absolutely. We're going to leave you with this thought today. It's another quote that comes from our dear sister, Corey Ten Boom. She says, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within yourself, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Jesus, you'll be at rest. We yeah. want to thank you for joining us today and may the peace of God be with you. The joy of the Lord occupy your heart and the love of God keep yeah. your soul.
God bless you richly. Pastors? God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Be, uh, well, uh, look forward to seeing you again. Praise God. And we thank you for joining us today. Remember, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. We are to be the shining light, the living example of the grace, the love, the power of the risen Jesus. You be blessed as you continue to walk with him. God bless you. Discover God's design for family through Bishop Eric Lambert's sermon series, Strengthening the Family. This powerful series will provide you with practical instruction on how to strengthen your family relationships using scriptures from the Word of God. Receive the five-part series, Strengthening the Family, on CD or DVD for your donation of $35 or more. To order, call 1-800-550-3284 or visit ericlambertministries.org. Get your copy of Strengthening the Family so you can build a family life that brings victory to your home and glory to God. Bishop Eric A. Lambert Jr. is committed to influencing our culture with Christ. In his book, The Christian in the Culture, Bishop Lambert explores practical ways to avoid becoming ensnared by the trends of today's culture. Order your copy of The Christian in the Culture and achieve daily victorious living. Visit ericlambertministries.org to purchase the book and discover more resources that will enrich your Christian walk. The Bethel Deliverance app is now available to download for free at Apple Store and Google Play. You can tune into Sunday services through live stream, view video sermons on demand, listen to audio messages through podcasts, send prayer requests, communicate through social media, and you can contribute to the ministry simply by using today's technology. Get access to all of Bethel's media outlets and church events right at your fingertips. Go to the Apple Store or Google Play and download Bethel Deliverance to get connected today. Praise the Lord. I'm Bishop Eric Lambert. I want to welcome you to the Eric Lambert Ministries website. On this website, you will be able to get information about books, CDs, DVDs, and even the printed word designed to help you in your walk with Christ. You'll find information about our YouTube channel and the services that we have at Bethel Deliverance International Church. And we want you to understand that our ministry is designed to lift up Jesus, to glorify his name, and to get you, the listener, connected to the power of the Holy Ghost. I am excited about the Eric Lambert Ministries website, and I want you to join us as often as you can, and we guarantee two things. You'll have a closer walk with Jesus. Number two, your life will be richer. God bless you. Access resources that will enrich your Christian walk today by visiting ericlambertministries.org. That's ericlambertministries.org. The Climbing Higher Broadcast with Bishop Eric A. Lambert Jr. is a part of the media outreach ministry of Bethel Deliverance International Church. Our goal is to reach the world with powerful messages of faith, truth, and victory taught from God's Word. You can take part in this significant mission by becoming a media partner. Your weekly, monthly, or one-time gift goes directly towards reaching the masses with life-changing messages of hope from God's Word. To find out more, visit the BethelDeliverance.org media link for additional information about our partnership options. We thank you for your seeds of support. The Christian and the Culture is a production of Bethel Deliverance International Church.